I think we'll go ahead and sort of get started here. Um, definitely, um, we'll leave this link up here just for a minute, a little bit longer. It's, there's a readme at that, that, that metal that, link, github.com slash bokeh, bokeh notebooks, tree slash master slash tutorial. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of a long link. Uh, that has all the information you would need to do to get, you know, get everything installed and get up and running if you need it. Um, also, additionally, uh, Katrina Real, one of our colleagues, is here. She's happy to help um, walk around and help people get um, you know, things installed, get things set up, and, and, and either me or Sarah can walk around and get help as well. But I think we'll go ahead and kick off. Sarah's going to start um, with a more in-depth dive into the uh, the charts notebook. We have actually all of these tutorial notebooks up on NB Viewer that she showed earlier. Um, and so we're going to go through as many of those as we can get through today, probably four, uh, and answer, come around and answer questions that people have uh, as you work. So great. Oh, That's it the is. Uh, there, yeah. OK. So. Um, yeah, so. In, save your questions for just a few minutes. Um, Brian and, but feel free to put, we're gonna do that now? Okay, um, we're gonna raffle some books off at the end. Um, Brian and Katrina and I will, will start coming around to help you. Feel free to put your hands up whenever and Brian and Katrina can, can, can come and help you individually. Um, I'm not gonna take too much time talking um, because I want you to start coding and then we can, you know, you can put your hands up if you're having problems. There are actually um, uh, eight notebooks in, in this series. We're just going to do the first four going over charts and, and in detail into plotting. Um, but you can, you can go and, um, you can go and do the rest on your, your own time if you want to explore more. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so please do try and get things running. With, uh, nope, it's this one. I mean, yeah, sorry, I can't select something. Got it? And, um, and, and Brian and Katrina can point you to it um, if you still can't find it. Okay, so. As we talked about this morning, I'll make this a bit bigger. As we talked about this morning, uh, the first thing you're going to do is do your is do your output notebook um, so that you have Bokeh.js available in your notebook. Um, what's going on? Okay. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, import some of the sample data. Uh, if you um, the if if you get an error about not having the sample data, the README um, the README shows how to how to how to get the sample data. You can also get it in the notebook, um, and Katrina and Brian can help with that. Um, so here we go. The the, the the flower data is very straightforward. It's four columns of numbers and some species. It's the classic iris set. Um, we're going to plot a scatter plot with x as petal length, y as petal width, and some colors. And we're going to specify the legend. Feel free to mess around with that. I can top right and so on. Um, and again, with, uh, with this sort of bouquet trying to be helpful, if I misspell it um, and come all the way down to the end of these errors, I would totally recommend trying to break things because getting used to these errors and the helpful hints at the bottom will really get you a long way. But if, as you can see in this error message here, it's told you like the valid, um, the valid options. Um, so there's that, uh, there's that. And um, in this, next, in this next example, what we've done is not only have we changed the color by species, but we've changed the marker by species. And so the charts have sort of default picked out three different markers for us to like aid with that visual uh, distinction. Um, so hopefully that's familiar from what we covered this morning. What we didn't talk a lot this morning about was the tools. Um, these are the tools that you can see at the top um, of each chart, which run at the on the client side, they don't no server necessary, and they let you interact with your data, the wheel, zoom, and and the box zoom and selections and so on. And so there's a full list here of all of the possible tools. Um, I uh, showed uh, Dan this morning asked a question about how do I add the hover tool, and I showed the sort of more programmatic way to say plot.add tools or chart.add tools, which you can always do. Um, but the shorthand way is to pass in just this sort of list of string, um, comma separated strings where you specify your tools. Um, so here's a box plot. We'll let you play with that. Um, again, a lot of this, I'm running through this because 
you know, I covered a lot of this ground this morning and I want you to start playing. Um, here's a bar chart where we've used one of our aggregation functions, median. Um, we've used group um, to group the, um, the different um, the different origins in little um, like mini groups, but this could also have been stack if I wanted it to be a stacked bar chart. Um, so have a little play with that. Oh, haha, sorry, I'm preempting myself. There's the, oh, and look, if we had a stack, we could change it to the group. Um, so you can have a little mess with that. Um, similarly, um, getting into histogram data. Um, I think the big thing to sort of start learning about here is, is playing with the bins. Um, and there's, there's some fairly complicated things you can do with bins. And actually, that's one area that I, the first thing I would do is open the documentation, which is pretty good about uh, histograms. And so that has taken us through to exercises, which is where I want to be. I want you guys to be um, I want you guys to be, to be trying to do this yourself and having a little bit of a battle. Um, so there's a sample data set from the US marriages. And we're just going to, the first exercise is just to try and make a, a line chart. Um, and you can also um, try playing with the, the dash, the line dash, like in the same way that we played with the, uh, the markers on the scatter plot. The next, um, uh, the next exercise is about uh, making bar charts from some... Um, data about countries winning Olympic medals. Um, and then if you're feeling very comfortable, I've put some advanced, um, some pointers to some advanced things looking at the blend and the, uh, the attribute specification. And so you can, you can have a mess around with that. I'm gonna say about 10 minutes um, till about quarter two, just after quarter two. Um, for you to have a go, ask questions, we'll come around and help and, um, and then we'll, we'll move on to plotting. All right. Okay, so that's quarter two. Um, you can keep having fun with this on your own. Um, a gentleman has just pointed out to me that I'm actually not sure how to make this. Um, so or I've just realized having tried to help someone that I'm not sure how to make this. Uh, so, aha. That is, that is a hot mess. Um, ooh, maybe I should try selecting, I'm gonna pull out the, um, I'm going to pull out the columns um, from, uh, hey, there you go. Okay, we still have an extra thing in here because it doesn't, so I pulled out just the three columns that we care about, which is the year, the marriages, and the divorces, so that we've just pulled out those particular columns in the data frame. And I'm going to, oh, thanks, and then I'm going to specify uh, that the X is going to be year. Uh, oops, that is. What? I didn't understand that. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh yeah, okay, maybe we should just be taking whoever solved this comes up and does it, um, but because that would be much smarter. Okay, I'm failing. People have uh, solved this. Oh, boy. And now the year is, uh, that's a, a line of year. Okay, that's particularly bad. I apologize for um, some hubris having done these tutorials before and now having uh, forgotten how to do them all. Um, I'm going to hand over to Brian, who's hopefully going to make slightly less of a fool of himself, um, to talk about plotting. And if any of you are still puzzled, um, we will certainly make the solutions available in some way. Um, if you haven't heard from us in a week and you still are struggling over it, the mailing list is the way to get in touch with all of us um, and, and find the answer to that question. Um, yeah, hopefully marginally more competent. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah's way too hard on herself uh, every day. Uh, okay, so uh, the next section we're going to talk about uh, is uh, the bokeh.plotting interface. So as I mentioned before, there's basically this very low-level models interface, which is just all the building blocks. You can sort of think of them as, you know, maybe have like a bunch of, oh, 
building blocks to put together. Sorry. Uh, and you can put them together in whatever way you want, which is very powerful. But of course, you can also put them together in crazy ways that don't make sense, which is also kind of uh, maybe a little pain. So above that, we have this bokeh.plotting level, which is a, an interface that's a little bit higher. And the, the main idea with bokeh.plotting is that you can attach the visual properties of shapes or markers or uh, lots of things about your plot to, directly to your data, right? So you might say, hey, I want to scatter the x and y positions of these circles according to these columns of data. Maybe I want to color the, the circles according to the column of the data or, or modulate the, the size of the radius according to some column. Maybe I've got uh, other shapes that I want to sort of uh, manipulate as well. And so uh, with that, you also get sort of a default plot that has a sort of standard axes that do auto sort of data ranging and and typically look nice, uh, and, and it's a default set of tools. And so it just gives you this nice sort of default plot that you can customize however you want, uh, and then you can throw these sort of glyphs, we call them glyphs, uh, shapes that are attached to data at them. So let's take a look. So we're using bokeh.plotting. So again, we have some fairly standard imports. We're going to want to import uh, output notebook because we're working in the Jupyter notebook and show as well. We also, from bokeh.plotting, want to import this figure function. That's what's going to give us uh, what we need to sort of get started. So we run that. We run output notebook. We see that it's successfully loaded in the notebook, which is great. So let's create a simple scatter plot. What does that look like? Let me actually make the font bigger. There we go. So uh, in this case, we create a figure. With the figure function, we give it a, a plot width and a plot height. Uh, in this case, just 400 by 400 pixels. And then we want to say a circle. We want to scatter a bunch of circles, right? So one way to do that is to just give the actual literal data directly in the call to circle. And that's what we've done here. So we give an array of x positions, an array of y positions. We give it a fixed size. In this case, size equals 15. Uh, we can specify things like the line color, the fill color. We can give the fill alpha, all of these values. Uh, and then we call show on the result of that. And sure enough, we get these five circles uh, with all of those things, with the line color navy. The fill color is orange. The uh, fill alpha is 0 0.5. And we can certainly change those very easily. Uh, in this case, you know, we could say line color equals you know, red. And we rerun it. And now it's, it's red. Um, you know, back at navy. Uh, we can also give a single value here, right? If I said something like y equals 10, right, I'm going to get sort of this vectorized data with everyone having the, the value y equals 10. But all of these attributes, that's the, the, the point is, all of these attributes can be vectorized. We could, for instance, say size equals you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Uh, and now the size is modulated, right? So we have one that has size 2 and one that has size 4. Size is usually in pixels. Radius is usually in data, data dimension units. Uh, but all the other ones here as well, all the colors, all the visual attributes can be vectorized in this way. You can either give them a single value, as we've done, for instance, with the line fill color, or you can give them a vector of values, in which case all of the things are different. So um, next exercise, first exercise here, if you go to this, this notebook, this is that second notebook, 02-plotting. Uh, uh, is to try to create the same example, but now set the radius instead of the size, and sort of see what's the difference if you set if you set radius instead of size. So I'll let everyone take a, a minute or so to do that, and I will work here as well. Maybe I'll say point to. Sarah will be back with the solution to the last problem shortly. <laughs> so as you're working, one thing to note about the size is if you actually start to use like the wheel zoom tool and we zoom, we've given the size, which is in pixel units, what's going to happen when we zoom, right? If I zoom in on the circle, uh, well, it's specified in size, which is pixel units. So it's not getting any bigger, right? As I zoom in, uh, it stays at the same size, which is you know, 15 pixels. Um, in the next exercise, you're going to change this to radius. And we'll try to see what, how the behavior changes when we use the radius, which is given in um, data, data space units.
Remember, if you're having any technical sort of problems, problems with installation or just other kind of issues, just raise your hand. Um, Sarah, Katrina can come, come by, or I can come down as well, take a look. Um, in the meantime, though, let's go ahead and talk about this exercise, right? So um, what I've done is I've changed now to, instead of specifying the size, I'm specifying the radius, and I gave it a value of 0 0.2. And sure enough, if you look at this, if you were to measure, you'd see that the radius is actually equal to you know, 0 0.2 in data space. Now what would you expect if I were to zoom this plot, right? Anything different? So because I've given the units in the radius, which is data units, now the circles actually get bigger, right? They're sort of responsive. They're, they're you know, if I zoom in, then obviously the scale of my plot changes and, and a, a 0 0.2 distance in, in data space takes up more space on the screen. And so that's just the main difference I wanted to indicate there. Um, again, this can also be vectorized. If I give it a, a list of radii, um, then I can get all of these different circles with different radiuses um, as well. And so again, all of the visual properties, all of these attributes of the glyph, uh, all of those are vectorizable or you, know, or you can give a single value. Okay, so we might want to do something else besides circles, so we can do squares. That's pretty easy. So we do we create our p equals figure to create our plot. We say p dot square instead of circle, and sure enough, it's the exact same thing. We can give it a color, we can give it an alpha, um, we can give it a vector of sizes. Um, all of that works fine, and we get this nice scatter plot basically of squares. You'll notice in this case, I actually gave alpha instead of line alpha or fill alpha. Alpha is just a convenience that the figure function accepts. Um, it means change both the fill alpha and the line alpha at the same time. So. Uh, the actual glyph properties are very specific. There's a line alpha for the, you know, the drawing of the line around the square, and then there's a fill alpha to fill the inside of the square. Uh, and then alpha is just a nice convenience to set both of them at once. So there's quite a few markers that Bokeh has. Uh, that are all basically these sort of scatter type markers. There's things like asterisk circles with uh, you know, X's through them, uh, squares, triangles, all of the standard sort of plotting markers you might expect uh, that you might want to make a, a scatter plot out of. Right? So all of the properties of all of these different markers can be vectorized in that way. So let's try um, some different markers. So we'll just copy this. This is a quick exercise. Let's just take maybe 90 seconds or, or thereabouts and copy this down here. And instead of doing square, I'll let you guys walk, uh, work along. We can do something like triangle. And sure enough, we get triangles, of course. Let's do something that has uh, a little bit more interesting structure to it, right? So if we do circle x, Um, it's kind of hard to see because they're the same color, but we can do things like change just the line color to be fire brick and just the fill color to be something different. And again, this could be a vector of colors. If you wanted to you know, sort of shade all the different uh, scatters by some other value, you can color map those values. And we're actually going to make that even easier uh, in the future. Right now, you'd have to do that color mapping on the Python side, but we're going to uh, make some nice easy ways to do that color mapping on the client side as well. So here you can see I've, I've changed it to circle X and I've given it um, you know, different properties uh, and all of that works really well. How would you vectorize the, the marker shape? The marker shape, right. So there's, um, there's actually not a really good way to do that right now. Um, you'd have to make separate calls on the different subsets of data you want. We've gone back and forth over whether the actual marker shape itself should be one of these data properties. It's not currently. So that's an idea that could definitely be discussed and we might want to add. That's the kind of thing that, the, actually it's a nice segue, that's the kind of thing the charts interface can do for you at a high level, right? The charts is really about saying, hey, I wanna do some of the, op you know, here you're very directly tying data to attributes of these markers or these shapes. Whereas charts is saying, hey, I might need to do some statistical processing on your data to split it up into groups, uh, and then I could assign each of the groups a different marker. And so the charts interface can do that, where it can say, I want this group to be you know, one marker and some other group to be a different marker. And so it's a little bit higher level. But with book it up plotting, it's a little bit, sort of a more mid-level, uh, and so right now you would, you would have to get your different groups of data and call p.circle on one group and p.square on the other group, and, and that's, that's how you would do that with, with bokeh.plotting. But bokeh.charts can do it sort of automatically. Good question. Uh, okay, line plot's probably pretty important as well, so there's a, a dot line method on that as well, fairly straightforward. Uh, again, I've given it some data. You, now you have things like line width that you can specify. So here I could change this to you know, line width equals four, and I get something that's sort of wider, and I can say things like line dash you know, equals um, two comma two. I think this is the right syntax, right? And I can, let's make that different. Let's give it five comma five, right? So now I get a dash line, and I can change the alpha as well. Two, and so now it's, it's much sort of lighter alpha. So all of those things are very easily configurable and changeable. Um, as well. So I'll just let you play around with that. Maybe just uh, do some of the sort of same kind of changes that I did. Um, there are other sort of more obscure 
properties of lines, you can change things like the, how the line mitering is done and how the line join is done, but I don't think this come up quite as often. These are probably the most common ones, the alpha, the, the width, and maybe the line dash as well. Yeah, so in bokeh dot plotting, it's it's very easy to do that, but it's it's two graphs. So the, the the nice thing is that you can just keep stacking these up, right? So let's actually do that. So if I create uh, line width equals two, and then I want to create something like uh, p dot circle, and let's give it the same points. So again, this is the sort of thing where the charts might do this and make a composite sort of chart for you, um, but the the plotting interface is just a little bit more uh, explicit. So let's say fill color equals white, and line color, we'll just leave it default. So now if we do that, you can see there are the markers. And so let's give them a different size, actually. That's pretty small. Size equals uh, 12 minus, right? So there's your, there's your connector. So you can add as many as you want. Um, in practice, if you have you know uh, a data set that's in a column data source, you might actually pass in the source, and then you would say something like x equals some field, some column in that data source, and y equals some other column in that data source. Um, so, but you can you can certainly pass in sort of literal data like this as well. Uh, under the covers, we're just creating column data sources for you. Okay. Another example, a little bit more heavily involved into NumPy, mostly just to sort of show you what is here, uh, is an example using images. Right. So there's this image class, it's an image RGBA, there's also an image URL to load images from URLs, uh, and there's also uh, an image class that can do a color mapping of, if you just have an array of numbers, you can do a color mapping in the client, but this one is the image, uh, image RGBA, which lets you just send raw RGBA data. So I'm not going to go too much into the details of the NumPy, but it's basically just, it's this code right here, these four lines are setting the red, green, blue, and alpha channel of an array. Uh, basically, just every 32-bit integer is a, an RGBA channel. Uh, it's setting those individually, uh, and then it's sending that over until you get this nice image. And again, we can, you know, we can zoom in, uh, change things, pan them around, whatever. All that works um, standard. So other kinds of glyphs. Um, uh, just to mention what's here, and there's some links in the notebook that take you directly to some examples. There's things like rectangles and ovals, right, which of course you can orient and, and change the angle of. There are segments and rays. If you need to have like a quiver plot, you can create a bunch of segments or a bunch of rays to show the sort of the vector field structure. Uh, wedges and arcs, useful if you do need to draw some kind of sort of donut or uh, <coughs> chart like that. Uh, and then there's of course specialized curves too. There's things like Bezier's uh, and quadratic curves, which I don't I haven't seen too many uses of, uh, although someone's actually working on a, a chord diagram chart, uh, and I think that's using the, the Bezier arc. So, um, so I'll you know, take a few minutes here and just let people sort of go crazy and, uh, and create some new charts here using any of these other glyphs here. So again, the links go to examples directly in the user's guide, so you can sort of copy and paste those to get started and then change them up with different data if you want. So I'll just I'll plot something down here. We'll see what we get. It'll take maybe two minutes. All right, so I just took the, uh, the previous example where I had some circles, some line, and here I had a square. So you can see a nice case of, you know, maybe I want to annotate or sort of highlight or draw attention to some particular one. So I added this, you know, square, and I said x equals 3, y equals 2, and, and so I found a particular one that sort of drew this nice uh, square on top of, and maybe that calls that out in some way. We have a, a couple of annotations. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but we have things that you like. Um, annotations that are polygonal regions or sort of box regions as well. So those are all possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we've actually sort of gotten ahead of ourselves. <laughs> the last section here uh, for bokeh.plotting is about plotting with multiple, multiple glyphs, and we've really actually already covered that, so I might go ahead and wrap up here and let uh, uh, Sarah move on to the next section, or I, I'll move on to the next section. But this is just an example of what I had before where I, I combine multiple glyphs, and you can combine as many as you want uh, onto one plot. And so. <coughs> Again, the main abstraction here is that we have these idea of glyphs, which are really just sort of shapes, uh, and we can attach the visual properties of the shapes to our data in a very easy way. Okay, so that's the 02 plotting notebook. Let's move on to the next notebook, which is 03 styling, and we can sort of take a look at how we can sort of customize some of the different properties of our plot. So again, we've got our standard sort of uh, imports up here at the top. Uh, Output notebook, show, figure. Uh, we call output notebook to load Bokeh.js into our running Jupyter notebook. Uh, and now we're going to want to be able to specify things like colors and the grid properties and the axis properties. Let's see, see what sort of things we can do. So first, a note about colors here. You can see there's a lot of different ways to specify colors. You can give CSS name colors. You can give RGBA uh, hex tuples. You can give uh, our hex values and, and tuples as well. So lots of different ways to specify colors in Bokeh. 
Um, additionally, we have a section here that explains a little bit about what we call properties. So all of these things, uh, things like circle glyphs and, and square glyphs, we call them you know, these bokeh models, they have what are called properties. And they're, they're basically just attributes, but um, they're nice in that they actually do type checking. Uh, and they know how to serialize themselves to Bokeh.js. So if you, if you set something in a value that doesn't make sense, Bokeh will try to, to warn you about that you know, as, as early as possible. You know, if you try to set the color value to a number, you'll actually get an error. And it'll say, hey, that's, that's not the right kind of value. You can't set the color to be a number. And so this is, I think, very helpful when you're developing things to have this kind of immediate feedback. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Apologize. Um, Plots themselves have a number of these high-level uh, or sort of attributes on them. So things like uh, there's, you know, there's an outline on the plot. Maybe you want that or want to change it or want it not to be there at all. Uh, and so you can change all of those things. So here I'm going to create a plot, uh, and I'm going to change the outline line width and the line alpha and the line color to be navy. And if we run this, sure enough, we get a new outline on the plot that's sort of much wider, and it has this navy color and this nice alpha as well. So you can customize these sort of properties on the plot um, very easily. So I'm going to give everyone just a minute to go ahead and, again, sort of take some of this code. Maybe you can look up in the user's guide. There's a whole section on customization and styling that's actually quite a bit more in-depth than, than this notebook. Um, you can look up some of the properties there uh, and create your own plot. And so I'll give everyone just a minute to do that. to go navigate to that. If you go to the user's guide or the, uh, the doc site, which again is bokeh.pydata.org, you can go to the user's guide. And under there, there's quite a few sections over here. But in particular, there is a section, make this uh, bigger, on styling visual attributes. Uh, and that's got, you know, again, quite a lot of information um, in addition to what's in this notebook about all the kinds of different properties that you can change, um, all the kinds of things you can change on, you know, on uh, plots as well. For instance, you can change like the, the title font size. I'll add that up here. All right, so now it's italic, for instance. So any questions about sort of this idea of attributes or properties? Um, again, basically everything in Python is an object. Um, for the Bokeh library in particular, we've sort of made the, the attributes sort of a little bit smarter in that they can do things like you know, check that the type or the values are, are reasonable or meaningful. Uh, and of course, they also know how to sort of uh, serialize them. All of this stuff's also uh, information is available in the reference guide. So there's a completely auto-generated reference guide. If you sort of know already what you're looking for, you can go to the reference guide here. I'm not sure why this is going off the screen. Um, there we go. Ah, OK. So if you go to the reference guide, um, you can see all of the different sections are here laid out. So you could go to, for instance, um, you know, bokeh dot. Uh, models and see all the different bokeh.models.glyphs and you can see there's all these different you know we have an annular wedge glyph and so you can see an example here and it can show you all the different properties you know the the end angle and the start angle the, the start radius and the end radius or the or the inner and outer radius rather those are the kinds of things that an annular wedge glyph has you know if you go to circle you would see that it has you know size or radius and, uh, and you know, line color uh, that sort of thing OK, so anyway, all of those are uh, always up to date, uh, automatically generated as part of our build process, so you can see them. OK, going back to the notebook, though, uh, any questions about just this first plot sort of styling? OK, might also want to style things like axes. Um, and this is actually something important uh, to mention here. Uh, the plot itself has this nice, convenient property called x-axis. Um, but there might actually be more than one axis, right? It's possible to create plots in Bokeh that have, you know, it's called like twin axis sometimes or multiple x axes. So whenever you ask for the axes, it actually gives you back a list of axes. Um, but we've made it kind of a special list that if you just want to set an attribute on it, you can do that, right? And we kind of have this name, we call it a splattable list. But here, even though p.x axis actually returns a list of things to me, I can still say things like p.x axis axis labels equals temperature. Whoa. Uh, or p.axis, you know, set the, the text color, right? So they behave like regular properties, even though they're actually setting all the properties of, of every x-axis. 
Again, these are the kind of properties that axes have. They have uh, the line property for the axis itself. The label has text properties. The, the major labels on the ticks have text properties and an orientation. The ticks themselves you know, have line properties, and you can also specify how far inside or outside the plot you want it. The minor ticks have the same kind of line properties and how far inside and out you want them. So you can really have very complete control and customization over the visual sort of look of your plot. So let's let me take a, a quick look at that. So here I've got um, creating a figure. Um, and I'm creating just scattering the X marker. Uh, and then I'm saying I want to change the orientation of the major labels on the X axis to be you know, pi over four. And I'm wanting the, the Y axis labels to be oriented vertically. And so if I run that, sure enough, the X axis labels are oriented sort of at this angle, 45 degrees. Uh, and then uh, the, the Y axis labels are oriented vertically. So you can do several of those at once right here. This next example here uh, changes a bunch of things, right? It changes like the line and text colors, it changes the actual labels on the, you know, and the orientation as well. So if I run this, um, we can see quite a few different changes, stylistic changes from sort of the default standard plot. You know, here I've changed the, the tick in and tick out values to make the, the ticks completely outside the plot. If I zoom in down here, yeah, okay, well, zoom's not working for me. But you can see that the ticks on the x-axis are now completely outside the plot. So you have really complete control over sort of the visual styling. So let's take a minute and I'll let everyone here sort of, you know, again, copy and paste this and just uh, play around with some of these values and make sure sort of setting them makes sense. Um, again, if you look at p.axis or p.x-axis, you would find that they actually return lists. Uh, but we've tried to make it nice and convenient, so that's why you can set properties uh, on these lists and it will set the property on all of the, the elements in that list. So p.axis.minor tick in we'll set that value on all of the axes that are returned. All right, so I actually do wanna at least have a little bit of chance to get to the last notebook, so I'm gonna speed ahead just a bit here. Um, and just say, here's what I did. I just, I copied and pasted and I, I changed a few values, right? I changed the, the titles or the labels, of course. I can change the width of those axes. I can change the colors. And again, the, the orientation of the labels, all of that stuff is configurable and, um, and uh, documented in the user's guide as well as the reference guide. Okay, uh, next one here is the grids, right? So grids themselves uh, are, for instance, the, the lines you know, in the middle of the plot, they have these grid lines. Um, those are controllable as well. They have line properties, but they also have fill properties. If you want, for instance, bands, right? Like maybe you want some horizontal or vertical bands in between the grid, you can set those. So let's try that. Um, well, here, actually, first off, we can certainly turn them off. If we wanna turn off, for instance, the, uh, the vertical grid here, I've set the grid line color for the X grid, that's the grid that intersects the X axis. I've set that to none, and so there is no vertical grid in this plot. And on the horizontal grid, I've set the alpha lower and I've given it a dash, and so it kind of has this nice, you know, if you really want to, what you want to emphasize is sort of the, you know, these, these horizontal uh, guides, you can certainly do that and have control to do that. We can also add bands. So here if I set something like uh, the, uh, the band fill color to be navy and, and zero one, sure enough, now I get this band. So you can have that sort of, that sort of thing as well if you want this uh, banded sort of display. Okay, um, if you want to, certainly you can again, copy and paste that and play around. Do wanna make sure to get to this last interactions notebook because I think it's really interesting and exciting. So uh, maybe just go run through this legends example right quick as well. Uh, legends, um, the way legends work with the plotting interface is basically each of these renderers line or circle, you can give it, um, you can give it this legend argument. So you can say something like legend equals sign X. Uh, and basically, the Bokadep plotting interface collects up all the legends with the same name, and it will draw a representative of those things together in the legend. And then you can give the legend itself is a, is a plot attribute, uh, p.legend location, bottom left in this case. Uh, and so we see that, sure enough, we have three plots here, and we can see that sine x has both the line and the, the filled circle represented. You know, two times sine x has just the orange dotted line. Three times sine x has the uh, you know the green line and the and the circle. And if you look up here, then sure enough, sine x is the the circle on the line. Two times sine x here is just the the single orange line. And then the uh, the last one that showed up in the legend is uh, line and square, right? And that's exactly what you see down here in the legend. So we can change the uh, the legend location, things like center. I think kind of silly in this case, but there's a legend right in the center. Um, it's also possible to uh, pass specific. Uh, screen space coordinates, if you really want to have fine grain control over where the legend goes, you can pass specific uh, coordinates for it to go, and you, of course, can pass off different uh, pad. If you want to say it in the upper left with, with this much padding around it, you can specify that as well. Um, again, all of that's in the, the user guide. If we go back here to the user's guide, um, the styling visual attributes section here has quite a bit of information about, you know, um, 
changing properties of glyphs. This actually, uh, this isn't in the tutorial yet, but I do want to point out, this is actually kind of cool as well. If you want to style things like selections, um, you don't have to write any code to do that. There are properties for things like the selected properties uh, or unselected properties. So here, uh, I've passed this non-selection fill color and non-selection line color. And what that just means is that when something's not selected, it changes automatically. So we can style what the unselected and selected values look like. Um, and we can also uh, do that for hover as well. So hover inspections, we can give it a hover, you know, hover uh, line color, hover fill alpha, all of that sort of visual properties. And so here I've set <coughs> the hover tool to use a, a horizontal, horizontal line to do the actual hit testing. And as soon as the hover is triggered, uh, it goes ahead and applies that hover property to any of the hovered glyphs. And so you can get that very easily without having to write you know, any code to do. You used to have to write like a JS callback to actually change the properties. And so all of that's automatically doable now. And it's, it's this code right here where I set the hover line color and hover alpha. Um, OK, so again, the, the user guide, especially for styling, is a really good resource. It has, again, as you can see, it's got all these live plots directly in it, along with the code that goes with them. So it's a really good resource for learning. So I encourage everyone to check out the, the user's guide. OK, last notebook here. I uh, did want to talk a little bit about interaction, since we, you know, we like to talk about Bokeh as being a really great tool for sort of interactive visualization. We should probably spend some time on that. So let me go ahead and increase the font here. Uh, again, I'm going to import output notebook and show. <coughs> There's lots of ways to create interactive plots with Bokeh. Certainly, you can have interactive plots that use the Bokeh server, interactive plots that don't use the Bokeh server. All the examples here are going to be sort of using just you know, uh, some of the, the client side capability that don't require the server. But uh, hopefully, that actually illustrates that you can do a lot uh, really without having to get to the server at all. First, just to mention, it's possible to have these layouts. So here, um, I've imported grid plot, but we've also seen there's like a V plot and an H plot. And it basically just lets us put multiple plots into a, a grid. Um, so here, I've got a, a grid of plots, sure enough. Uh, I've said I want a, you know, a row of plots, S1, S2, S3, and they just all go in here, and that's, that's sort of great. Um, we can do the same code, but instead of a, a grid plot, it's going to let you all follow along sort of while I work through some of these, just for sake of time, because we're getting close to the end here. So here, instead of grid plot, I want to do V plot, and I want to put So I, I should mention, we are going to be uh, sort of taking a second pass at uh, some of this layout stuff. Um, some really exciting work for automating and making the layouts look better and also simplifying how to spell them is coming. So a few things may change a little bit here, but uh, hopefully not too much. Uh, oh, sorry. I just need to give it. I think I just need to give it the list here. Still just actually as args. There we go. Right. So one thing you'll notice is that Gridplot actually has this option if you notice the, the one up here, Gridplot has this option to sort of uh, have a single toolbar. In this case, I said toolbar location none. But if, if I did add toolbar, it would actually add a single toolbar that controls all the plots. But the other layouts are, are not quite so smart. Vplot, you know, they all have their own individual toolbars, which is sometimes is what you want. Uh, maybe sometimes it's not. But you can always tell the toolbar location to be none, and it'll uh, turn the toolbars off. OK. Another thing that's important is that we wanted to make it easy to have linked operations like linked panning and linked brushing. Uh, Sarah already really demonstrated that. I'll show it very briefly again. Here, I create two plots, or three plots rather, and what I share between them are the ranges. I say things like the Y range is equal to the Y range of my first plot, the X range is equal to the X range of my first plot, same thing for this third plot. And if I, if I put those here, and sure enough, if I pan one, then they all respond, right? So however I pan this one, uh, the X and Y range is linked for the first plot. However, I pan this one, just the X range is linked, so I don't see the other plots go sort of up and down vertically. But uh, it's really easy. We want to make it very easy to have these kind of linked interactions without actually having to write any, any code, really. We want, you, know, you give a specification. You say, I want to link the ranges. And that's, in fact, all you have to do to make um, those kind of linkages work. So linking uh, ranges, linking panning is a matter of sharing the, the, the range objects themselves. Uh, there's also this linking of data sources. So if you have two plots that share the same data and you want to have sort of automatic you know, selections in one drive the visual selections in another, that's super easy. You just share the column data source. So in this case, I'm creating a column data source by hand. I'm just giving it that, that data dictionary where I have these named columns of data. And then when I say left.circle, I can specifically say use that data source. Right? And so both of these plots, <coughs> excuse me, both of those plots, I'm giving them the exact same data source object. Right? So they share the same data source on the Python side. And the way Bokeh works is that they actually share the same data source on 
the JavaScript side as well. So when a selection happens and it says this is the selected points on this data source, all the plots that use that data source respond. And so here, if I actually run this code, sure enough, this is what we had before. Uh, I can make my last lasso select tool, uh, and I can you know make a selection here, and, and that just uh, will cause the selection to happen on both. I can do disjoint selections. I hit the, the shift key there, and then I continued my selection. That lets me do sort of a disjoint selection as well. So anyway, that just automatically uh, highlights the corresponding plot uh, points in another plot. Now, sometimes you have to do things that are a little bit more sophisticated. If your data isn't on the same source, you can actually still link selections, but you might have to write a little callback to do that, and we'll, we'll see some examples of that here in a bit. This one, if I have time, I might let everyone actually try to take a little bit of time to work on it. But the hover tool is another sort of nice tool that's built into Bokeh. Here I'm creating a column data source. It's got fields x, y, and sort of description. So it's just some x and y points and some random data associated with each point. And now I want to create this hover tool. And what I'm saying is I want to show the index of the point. You know, is it the first point, the second point? <coughs> I want to show the x and y you know, actual cursor positions. Then I want to show this description value. And so these are the things I've configured to be the fields for my tooltip. Uh, and then I can just add this uh, to my tool, right? So here, in this case, uh, I'm creating a figure. I'm passing in the actual tool. So again, as Sarah mentioned, you can give those nice string names, but you can also pass in actual tool objects. So here, I actually pass in that hover tool. Uh, I add a circle, uh, and then go ahead and create this plot. And so now, I've actually got two here. There's one that has the custom hover and one that has uh, the default hover. So this one on the left here is the default hover. It's just sort of this dark blue background. It shows that index. It shows the x and y position. Uh, it shows the corresponding description field for every point that I hover over. Didn't really have to write much any code. Um, I'm not sure where this code gets custom hover. Um, if you have the repository checked out, there's probably another file that has it. But it's possible to customize the look as well. So this actually, the custom hover shows you know you can actually style this in a more uh, sort of more HTML webby sort of way if you really want to style the look of that hover tool. There's other options too, things like if you want to have the hover tool only snap to the center of each glyph. Um, you can tell it, I only want to snap to the center. I don't actually want to sort of you know, have the, the mouse go anywhere. And so that's what this is doing. But you can also control the selection. If you only want, for instance, the selection to go on a vertical line, or do you want the selection to, to hit on the exact mouse point, there's lots of different ways to control that. <coughs> Excuse me. Throat is very dry if you're talking. Um, OK. Uh, a few more sections here, because we only have about, I think, four minutes, so <laughs> very quickly. Uh, IPython Interactor, so IPython has its own widget set, and you can use these very well together with Bokeh. So here, uh, I'm going to create a plot, and it's great. It's another little sine wave. I like making sine waves. Uh, and then uh, I use IPy widgets. If you're not familiar with it, it sort of lets you easily create sort of GUIs. Here, it's, you, know, you give it some fields, and so it makes a drop down. Uh, and then you give it you know, this, this width and amplitude. And what happens, you know, so I give it a range here, so IPython creates this slider, and what happens is it calls this update function. And if you look at the update function, it simply, you know, updates the data. It says source.data, and then the magic happens here where I call push notebook, which says I want to actually update the version of this plot in the notebook. And so you can see that as I slide, you know, as I scrub this slider, the, the, uh, the frequency changes, the amplitude changes, you know, the, the phase changes as I, I scrub that slider. Uh, if I pick out something else in the, you know, in the drop down to cosine, I get the cosine chart or the tangent chart. So this doesn't require, again, doesn't require the book or anything like that. It works really well in the notebook with the uh, IPython sort of built-in interactors if that's, if that's what you want to use. Um, sliders here as well. Um, you can use the sliders in, in the, note, the, the bokeh widgets in the notebook as well, and you can attach JavaScript callbacks. We're still working on having sort of notebook and, and bokeh server interactions work really seamlessly together. But um, you can definitely use bokeh widgets with these uh, JS callbacks. So let me demonstrate that right, that, uh, right quick. So here I'm creating a custom JS callback, and I'm giving it a tiny snippet of JS code. So I guess we were relented just a little bit, and we're like, if you, if you don't mind writing just a couple of lines of JS code, you can actually have really, really rich interactions um, still straight from Python. So here um, I added this tap tool. I said the callback just calls alert. And sure enough, if I tap on one of the things, I get an alert that says, hello world. Right? So I can hook up my tap locations or my selections or my range changes to these little bits of JavaScript code very easily. So there's a bunch of places you can add these kind of JS callbacks. Um, any kind of widget like a button or a toggle or a drop down, a slider, you can have a, a callback you know, when the value of those changes or when they're clicked. Uh, all, various tools have them. Uh, anytime the ranges changes, you, uh, range changes, you can attach a callback to that as well. Anytime a, a data selection happens, you can attach a callback. <coughs> so here's a more sophisticated example, uh, which you guys can look at sort of in detail on your own. But um, it's a custom JS callback that's attached to the slider. And what it does is it just recomputes the Y values 
uh, some X data and some Y data. It recomputes the Y values. Uh, let's actually run it. And you can see that it's, it's plotting this straight line here. But if I scrub the slider, it recomputes different Y values. And it actually gives me sort of X to this power. Right? And so this is all happening in the client. There's no bokeh server. Um, these kind of things are very possible. Uh, but even better, <coughs> more recently, we added the flex.py script package. One of our co core contributors works on that. And you can actually write these callbacks now in Python. And they will be compiled to JavaScript. So that's important to, to sort of point out. But the same, the same exact callback can be written this way. You can say callback, and I can say, you know, get my, get my data, you know, set the value, loop over it, and, and call math.pow, and then, and then trigger a change on the data source. And so that's written in Python, but it actually turns into JavaScript that's used in the, in the client. Um, so hopefully that makes adding this kind of callback even easier. Last but not least, maybe a little bit more sophisticated example, um, you can do uh, callbacks on selections. So anytime. <coughs> Uh, anytime the, uh, the selection changes on this data source, it calls this code here. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, but what it does is it computes the average, <coughs> the average Y position of whatever has been selected. So if I select a bunch of points up here, it computes that average position, and then it repositions that orange line according to what that average is. So this is just meant to be a demonstration. Um, again, that works with multiple selections as well. So I'll make two disjoint selections. All that works. But anyway, that's, I think, pretty much the last thing here. Um, and wow, we're right at time. I think that was it. Um, Sarah, do you want to have any sort of final concluding yeah, uh, remarks? Uh, oh, just kind of uh, Brian and I will be around all week uh, at the Continuum booth. So yeah. to get the solutions to the bar charts, which I did figure <laughs> out, I was having a bit of stage blank mind panic. And um, yeah, uh, and any other questions you have, like feel free to come and find yep. us in person. Um, we're also always on the mailing list. So please do ask your questions there. Um, and try and help other people if you can. Uh, yeah, and welcome to Bokeh. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening.